Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. My name is Bob Flax, and up until now, I've introduced myself as the executive director. But as many of you know, I'll be retiring at the end of July. So CGS conducted a search for our next leader, and I'm happy to announce that we have a new executive director. For those of you who are on early, you just met her a moment ago, but we'll get back to that in just a second. So I'll be serving the rest of my term until the end of July as president, and will continue after that in a volunteer capacity. But at this time, I'm delighted to officially introduce our new executive director, international human rights attorney, Rebecca Shute. So Rebecca, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thank you so, so much, Bob, um, for introducing me. I'm delighted to come to my very first book club. Um, I had a wonderful flight uh, catching up with the book. It was a uh, wonderful in-flight reading. Um, uh, to those of you who I have not yet had the chance and pleasure of meeting. Um, please, I welcome with open arms and open doors um, any conversations, any uh, insight that you may have. I'm really delighted that Bob and uh, all of our wonderful board have made such an easy path so far for me. Um, and I apologize if I'm a little bit hoarse of coming just off a flight right now. Um, thank you, and I look forward to many um, future engagements and opportunities to serve the movement. You're terrific. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you were able to tune in right after getting off the plane in Copenhagen. <laughs> so that's that's terrific. So, um, so as always, we're also joined by our book club production team of Gail Hughes, our club coordinator, and Dre Bergman, our program manager. And I'd also like to welcome any new people to the book club. So if you're just joining us for the first time, if you would be willing to introduce yourself, if you would um, raise either your cyber hand or your flesh and blood hand, and we'll ask you just briefly to say your name, where you're from, and just a sentence or so of what brings you to this group. So if anybody who's new to the group um, wants to do that, you can do that now. Going once, going twice. Okay, seeing no takers. Um, we up. Oh, I see a taker, Gary. Okay, well, <clears throat> right now <clears throat> I live in Ukraine, and I just returned from some activities outside of in Israel, and so basically I tried to read the book that we're reading today, and of course the the people that have written it I've known for most of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I knew. Uh, uh, Augusto, initially, I guess in Washington, D.C., was a long time ago. I remember we had lunch together, but he's also been at my home in Moscow. And so anyway, we've been connected on and off during the years. And of course, also Arthur, um, when I was uh, 18 years old, I met him at his home in Washington, D.C. And, and both Arthur and I have been running around the world, uh, I guess Augusto too, for most of the time that we've been working. So I'm in Ukraine, <clears throat> the war is going on. Sometimes I don't like to be online because of these things that are happening. But uh, anyway, I think most of us know what is happening. Uh, they see it and they learn about it. It's a pitiful situation and it's looking pretty bad as we go forward. So I guess that's enough. Well, I'm, I'm very glad you could join us and thank you for that brief report. Um, anyone else who is here for the first time who wants to say hello? Uh, this is first time people, Lars. Yeah, I somehow stumbled about the invitation. Greetings from Strasbourg. The European Parliament had a meeting today. It was interesting to see in, uh, one transnational democracy, uh, well, not working with German libertarians. Uh, I'm mainly with Globe uh, Think Tank, uh, thinking about direct democracy on the global level. And the topic overall was interesting, and so I thought I'll listen in. I might have to hop on to a, a World Federalist meeting later on, but I'm looking forward to hearing the part, first part of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us. And it's nice to see we're getting more of an international reach. Um, anyone else here for the first time? Going once, going I, twice? I've been here then, right, Bob? I don't know. I go to so many meetings, but I'm it, I'm. A Okay, um, thank you. So um, 
So today is our fourth session discussing the book, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. We'll be focusing on part three of the book, Governance and the Management of, global, of Multiple Global Risks. And those are chapters 13 through 17. Um, some of you may have gotten the email earlier today from Maya Graf, one of the authors who has a bad cold, so she won't be joining us today. Um, but we are fortunate to have the other two authors, Augusto Lopez Claros and Arthur Lyon Dahl, who will be here for the session. So we'll proceed as usual with the authors pointing out the highlights and main ideas from those chapters, and then we'll open it up for discussion. <laughs> I'll ask everybody to go on mute now, if you're not already on mute, and please remain on mute throughout, you know, when, except when you're, when you're asking questions later on to eliminate the echoes and the background noise and all that. You're welcome to use the chat to communicate to the group, but we won't be monitoring it. So if you wanna ask a question when that time comes, you would need to raise your cyber hand or your physical hand. And as always, we'll stop about five minutes before the end of the session. So if you have any announcements, any things you wanna promote, an event, a book, or anything like that, we ask you to hold those announcements until the end, and there'll be time for that. So at this time, I'll turn it over to our authors. Um, so whoever um, is, is planning to go first, uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you all for joining us again as we go through this, this exploration of the challenges of making global governance work in the 21st century. Uh, I'll say a little bit about chapter 13, and then I'll leave it to Augusto to come in on chapters 14 and 15, which are really, those are his specialty, and then I'll come back again for chapters 16 and, and 17, so we sort of share the effort, you know, in the presentations here. Uh, chapter 13, it's really, what you might say, it's an, an overview of the need for a more systems perspective on global governance. The main theme, of course, is the specialized agencies, but they illustrate how the own system is divided up very much in silos, as with most other organizations. So you have agencies dealing with, with food or with health or you know, with education. Uh, we have conventions on various things and so on. And you have a highly fragmented system which is not very easy to make to work. And over the years, it's gotten, gotten worse and worse as we've had more and more issues requiring some kind of a global response. So the, you know, the chapter talks about some of the, the challenges of pulling this all together. My own work in the UN, you know, I was according to the UN system-wide Earth Watch for a decade, which meant working with 50 parts of the United Nations system. And you know, the challenge of getting them all to, to work together was not easy. I remember attending one meeting where head of an agency like I said, he was under orders not to cooperate with my organization. From, you know, there was a, some problem, personality problem between the heads of the organization. And so they were refusing to cooperate. So human issues sometimes come in as well as the more institutional challenges. So that one of the other points of course is important in that chapter 13 is the value of the sustainable development goals. That we do have governments agreeing to a more integrated perspective. And that's one of the, you know, the best examples where you know, they came up with the 17, 17 goals following on uh, from the, you know, the whole effort to sort of rethink the UN system. And uh, so this has been uh, you know, a, a, a blueprint for cooperative action. And they were designed to put off, even though sometimes uh, people look at one, one or another, look at their own special area and to ignore everything else. But at least the UN system has come up with some more systemic integrated frameworks uh, to sort of plan how things should work with each other. It's the more at the administrative level that it's difficult to you know, get the different parts of the machinery to work effectively. And of course, the other challenge with all of that is the fact that, that with this you know, sort of siloed approach, governments, even if they're parts of the whole system, they may send a different ministry to a different meeting and they don't often coordinate at the government level. And so you have, you, you have failures from government to be able to uh, contribute to the, you know, in effectively the parts of the system and even sometimes being contradictory in what they say in one agency or another. And so these are some of the challenges that, that come in, which is why you know, we really propose here that we need to come up with some more umbrella mechanisms, some way of breaking down some of these, you know, these differences and achieving, and of course, 
if we, as we saw earlier in the book, when we talk about you know, the role of the General Assembly, if that could actually become a global legislative body able to pass binding legislation at the global level that would apply to all countries, then we'd give us a mechanism for bringing together, say, the many different you know, conventions, each one negotiated separately with separate parties meeting in their separate conferences of the parties and, uh, and dealing with one particular area. Uh, but you know, it, when you have, say, just over 500 environmental conventions, you know, the challenges for a small country in keeping up with all of this, the bureaucracy gets multiplied many, many times. So we really need as part of this step going forward to be able to go beyond you know, this totally sectoral approach that we see and begin to find ways of you know, learning what, we, what is the best of what we have, but putting together in a more coherent fashion so that in fact, we can reduce a lot of the burden on governments participating in the international processes. So I may stop there with you know, a sort of a summary of the key theory, themes in chapter 13 and leave it now to Augusto to take us on to the more economic dimensions in chapters 14 and 15. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I guess when we were putting together the, the, the book, we decided that we didn't just want to focus on um, you know, the political and international relations aspects of global governance. Uh, the book does have a, a focus on UN reform. Many of the chapters, uh, uh, as, you, as you saw from the previous engagements that we have had, you know, have that strong um, sort of storyline. But we wanted to go a little bit beyond. And, and for that reason, you know, we have a, a chapter 18 on, on corruption. We have chapter 15 on the IMF, which is one of the more weighty um, UN agencies uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, created in 1944. And then we have also a chapter on issues of inequality. And so, um, because we feel that you know, to the extent that some of these problems are not addressed, for instance, you know, the issue of inequality, you know, if inequality is allowed to persist, if it continues to, to remain in the background as a very, very uh, sort of serious social problem, it will have, uh, you know, governance implications. It will make, uh, you know, more and more countries ungovernable. And this will have, uh, uh, you know, political and social ramifications that, that, that would be potentially systemic. And so for that reason, you know, we wanted to have a more comprehensive view of governance. And for that reason, you know, we included chapters such as uh, you have identified and we are, which are the subject of today's discussion. I wanted to share with you, you know, some of the, some of the sort of data and some of the issues that were addressed in the in, in these chapters, the, the two chapters that Arthur has mentioned. And so let me begin with inequality. Um, inequality and, and sort of slash poverty. Um, you know that um, there's, there's really interesting data and, and I will take a, a, the liberty of doing the following. If I was quoting some numbers, let's say, on inequality in, in, in the book, if we were quoting some numbers on inequality, I'm just going to update those numbers to reflect the latest data. I think it just makes it, it makes sense to do that, right? It doesn't change the storyline at all, but it just gives you, you know, more updated information, you know. But I guess one of the one of the stories that has that has emerged in, in the in the recent years since we wrote the book is the extent to which uh, um, we are not going to make the progress in reducing poverty, extreme poverty that we had expected at the time that the book was written. You know, when, when the book was written, there was every expectation that we would at least be able to fulfill a sustainable development goal, goal number one um, on the elimination of extreme poverty by 2030. Um, that goal is completely out of reach now. The World Bank has officially explained that um, in the, in, even in the most optimistic scenarios, um, that, that goal is out of reach. Um, and this is partly because of COVID, which uh, involved a setback for the first time in 30, year, 30 years, when uh, 
the reduction in poverty, uh, extreme poverty was reversed. And it's also the impact of the war in, the Ukraine, uh, on, in Ukraine, which has had you know, additional repercussions on, on inflation in particular, which especially affects um, people with low incomes. And it has had impact on energy prices, fertilizer prices, you know, the the, the cereal markets, uh, and, and so on. You know how disruptive this this war has been, and those things are going to impact, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the 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 goal of reducing extreme poverty. And so the latest numbers from the World Bank suggest that by 2030, in the best of circumstances, we're still going to have around sort of 600 million people or so under the extreme poverty line. And that's really, re really regrettable. One of the interesting points that we made in the, in the book um, is that um, we, we, we try to introduce a note of caution with respect to a, a kind of triumphalism or optimism that exists in the development community about the progress that has been made you know with extreme poverty because you know uh, th this this is the way that the people would you know say some some economists would immediately counter what, what i have just told you right i told you 600 million uh, uh, people under the extreme poverty line by 2030 and then they would come and say yes but in 1990 in 1990 40 years before we had 2 billion people, right? And so even if we end up with 600 million people by 2030, we still have made huge progress, right? And the, the counter argument to that would be to say that if you use a more reasonable poverty line than $2.15, which is what the World Bank is using now, which is an extremely austere poverty line, which basically means that if you're under it, you know, you you are malnourished, you don't have access to electricity, do you don't have access to water. If your husband loses his job uh, 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 today, your children are not going to have anything to eat tomorrow and so on, right? So it's, it's a, a, a kind of a, a, a form of poverty that is demolarizing and degrading, right? So if you raise that poverty line to something a little bit more reasonable, not so cruel, right? not, so, not so austere, um, and there is such a poverty line. It's six dollars and eighty-five cents, um, which I myself personally think is a little bit more. It it it, it sort of the, the profile of the person who lives with six dollars and eighty-five cents or less per day is not quite so dramatic and demoralizing as the extreme poverty line. But if you use six dollars and eighty-five cents, then it turns out that forty-seven percent of the world's population is poor. Right, one out of every two persons in the world is poor. Right, this is a powerful statistics, my friend. I mean, it is. It just suggests the extent to which you know we have a problem in the world. You know, um, inequality is again. You know, I don't want to bore you with a lot of the statistics, but I do want to mention an exercise that we did which is actually referred to in the book, as I remember, right? Which, um, which goes as follows. Just bear with me for a few, for a few seconds, okay? I, I'm gonna explain you. It's a simulation. It's a simulation um, that, 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 that uh, the, the, the results of which are really quite, uh, quite fascinating. Um, and the story goes as follows, right? Um, a few years ago, probably around the time that we were writing the book, an IMF uh, former colleague of mine published a, an op-ed piece in the Financial Times. And um, I read it because the, the title of the op-ed was The Golden Age of Growth. And well, you know that immediately caught my attention. And so I read it. And essentially the, the thesis of the piece was the following. Um, for the last 20 years, the low-income countries have been growing at twice the speed of the high-income countries. Therefore, we have solved the problem of poverty. They will eventually converge, right? Just it's the nature of compound interest. If a low-income country is growing twice as fast as Germany, it will catch up eventually, right? If you assume that that pattern continues, you know, for years and years and years. And, and what wasn't said, 
and this is where we come in. What wasn't said is how long is that catch up process going to take, right? So, so we did a simulation and in the simulation, what you do is you do the following. You say, okay, fine. Um, let's assume that the low income countries continue to grow at twice the pace of the high income countries for the next many, many years, right? Just let the, let the, computer, let the computer sort of loose and do that simulation. And then compare what happens to the income per capita of the low income countries, which is about $700, to the income per capita of the high income countries, which is about $48,000. Right? And it turns out that what happens is that the gap between these two groups of countries continues to rise for many, many years because you are applying, let's say, Two and a half percent to forty-eight thousand dollars versus four point seven percent to seven hundred dollars. Right? And so, if I ask you, um, Bob, I am in a generous spirit today. Uh, what would you like me to give you? Four point seven percent of seven hundred dollars, or two point six percent of forty-eight thousand dollars? If you're rational, you're going to say, "Give me two point six percent of forty-eight thousand dollars." Right? And you don't even need a calculator for that. Right? So what happens is that this gap widens and widens and catch up eventually happens as was claimed by my, my IMF colleague. Um, it does happen because that's the nature of the exercise. You know, you're, they're growing more rapidly than Germany and Sweden and, and the United States. But you know when the catch up happens in the year 2226. In other words, it takes two centuries, you know, for, um, a low-income country in sub-Saharan Africa to finally have the, the, you know, the access to medical services and the quality of the standard of living, you know, that you see in the high-income country, right? And so the fact that it takes two centuries to get there, you know, suggests to you that we have a serious problem of inequality as well. I could give you other interesting statistics that we quote in the, in the, in the chapter, but I, I, I won't bore you. We go into solution, right? Because it's one thing to diagnose a problem, right? But then people will want to say, well, what, what would you, what do you suggest that we do? And we, and we do offer all kinds of solutions. You know, there, there are, you know, poverty is a problem, uh, inequality is a problem that is amenable to technical fixes. Uh, and countries have done it. I mean, if you, you know, economists have a, a, a something called the Gini coefficient, which is a, a, a metric that captures uh, the sort of income inequality, you know, the higher the Gini coefficient, uh, which is between zero and one or zero and a hundred, the, the higher the level of inequality. And there are countries in the world, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Japan, even France, you know, that have relatively low Gini coefficients. And there are countries like Brazil and Colombia and Chile and, you know, many countries, South Africa and uh, United States, China, Russia, that have high Gini coefficients, right? And so you ask yourself, well, why is it that some have address in, in some way the problem of inequality and others haven't? And so, um, you know, we have some proposed solutions in, in, in the book, you know, things that have been tried, um, things like, for instance, uh, uh, better use of resources. Don't spend uh, trillions of dollars, which we are doing globally, subsidizing energy and making climate change worse, and reallocate those resources to education, to public health, to infrastructure, to things that are actually going to improve uh, productivity and are going to improve, improve uh, you know, co competitiveness, right? Um, what about, uh, you know, having tax systems that are more progressive, you know, that allow, that make the rich people make, make more of a contribution to the, to the pool of resources which are available to the government, which then can be used for redistribution. This is done, but it's not done so well. Uh, even in countries like the United States, you know, um, the tax system, it, unfortunately, in many ways has been has been appropriated by the elites and by the rich people. And whenever, uh, whenever uh, you know, a, a new government comes into in, 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 into power, you know, it's very tempting to reduce taxes. And the way it's done in countries like the US, it's usually to the benefit of, of you know, the high income, the high income households rather than the low income households. But it doesn't need to be this way. And there are countries that have more equitable tax systems. You know, there is the whole issue of, for instance, uh, profit sharing. Um, profit sharing is a, a way in which uh, 
you can reconcile the interests of the owners and the, and the workers, capital and labor. Um, in, a, in a world of profit sharing, a worker would get uh, two sources of income, his wages and salaries for the work that he does on a day-to-day -day basis, but he would also get a share of the profits of the company. And in, there, are, there, there are some studies that have been done, you know, looking at the specific industries and, 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 and firms, and where it happens, there is an opportunity to actually reduce income, in, income inequality, and, and so on. Um, gender is a very important component of, of uh, uh, reducing in gender inequality. We live in a world in which there is a great deal of uh, discrimination against women, and where it happens, uh, income inequality is worse. Let me give you one example to conclude my, my comments on this, on this chapter. Um, in Russia, um, there are 456 occupations which are forbidden to women. Okay, not five, not 10, no, actually at the World Bank, we identify 456 specific job occupations where women simply cannot, cannot work. Right from trivial things like driving the metro in the metro system in any any metro system in the in the the underground you know in in the in the country to hundreds of jobs in the energy sector and in other sectors you know which are highly paid but which are protected women cannot work it has nothing to do with protection it has nothing to do with risk it's just simply a very overt way in which the men have fixed the rules in a way that. They, they keep for themselves the, the most highly paid occupations. I ask you, if you marginalize half of the population in the country, the women, and don't allow them to gain access to these very highly paid occupations, what do you think is going to be the impact on income inequality? Well, obviously it's going to worsen it. It's, it, you know, it's just the, the, the arithmetic of it, you know, immediately tells you, it's intuitively obvious that, that in, income inequality is going to be worse, you know, if you are, discriminating against, against women. Well, to finalize, the World Bank has a database, which was actually built under my direction for, for many years. Um, it started before I joined the World Bank, but we expanded it uh, significantly during the years that I was, I was there. Um, of the 190 countries in the world that, that are part of the database, there are only 14 countries, less than 10% of the countries in the world. 14, not four zero, one four. There are only 14 countries that we could identify where the laws in some form or other do not discriminate against women. Uh, that is a shocking commentary about, about the extent to which women are being marginalized. And, uh, and my point here is essentially that this worsens income inequality in, in a big way. I'll stop here. Well, Bruce, will you do the next chapter as well? Will you do? Oh, um, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. I, I just take them, in yeah. order. take them in order. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we take them in order. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. That's, uh, that's, uh, um, okay. The, the reason, the reason we, we decided to do a chapter on the IMF is because, um, you know, it's a very, it's a very weighty organization. It has, it has jurisdiction over global financial issues. It is the organization that is very much at the center of management of the, of the global financial architecture. And therefore it matters a great deal whether it, whether it is well managed or whether it doesn't, it doesn't do its job very well. This can have you know, dramatic implications on a global scale. A recent example, or relatively recent example. In what happened in 2008 and 2009, we had a global financial crisis, you know, which basically, um, was highly destabilizing. It led to you know, increases in unemployment, a contraction of economic output. It, uh, it, 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 in some cases, like in the United States, it basically pushed the country to near collapse uh, you know, for its banking system and so on and so forth, right? And um, in assessments that were made ex post about you know, the factors that contributed to the financial crisis, one factor that was very important that was very important and was highlighted was basically that the IMF was sleeping at the wheel. They were completely clueless. They had no sense that the crisis was the crisis was coming. And literally six months before the the, the system practically imploded, you know, the IMF was uh, 
uh, writing reports talking about you know the resilience of the financial system and the efficiency of the markets and and so on to the extent that an independent evaluation group that exists within the IMF you know to to give the organization a certain sense of transparency and independence wrote a withering report basically saying that you know accusing the IMF staffers of groupthink and and essentially you know being being um, completely unaware that a crisis was coming. All right. So, so we we um, decided to, to because of the systemic ramifications of mismanagement of the global financial architecture, we thought that we needed to have a chapter on the IMF, and 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 our chapter was meant and was written in a way that was constructively critical. Right. In other words, it wasn't just a, 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 our purpose was not to highlight the errors and the mistakes of the past, was rather to question, you know, how can the IMF be a, a made a stronger? What are some of the reforms that could be done internally to make the organization a better crisis manager? Right? And one of the reasons, and this comes out in the chapter, of course, if you read it, but one of the reasons why the, 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 the IMF is important is because it is an, a, a small bank of issue, you know, it is an organization that actually can create international liquidity in the way that the Fed or the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan creates liquidity in dollars and euros in, in yen, right? The IMF has its own currency. It's called the SDR, the Special Drawing Right. It is a, a very a bit of a mouthful. It is not exactly a friendly name. What on earth does a special drawing right mean? Right, that the, the, the term itself is you know causes confusion and bewilderment when people first hear it. But it is it is like a dollar. It, it is a currency, and the, the IMF can actually issue SDRs and add to global liquidity, and therefore it can potentially role play you know, a, a kind of a stable, stabilizing role in the world. And, and so for us, you know, to, to, to analyze how it does it and how it could do it better was, I think, an important contribution to the, to the you know, to the whole subject of, of global governance, you know. And just let me say a few, a few words about the SDR issue because um, uh, I am, I, I, actually, there is a, a book coming out later this year, Oxford University Press, <clears throat> It's called an IMF, IMF handbook. It's essentially a collection of papers from you know, several researchers. And I was invited to make a contribution to that volume. And in a way, what I did is I updated the chapter that, I, that is included in the book that you're reading, um, because that was whatever, 2018, 2019. And now we're you know, four years later. So the world has changed very quickly. And, and some of those recommendations that are included in the book, you know, have been updated and modernized and made more relevant in light of what has happened since then, you know, including COVID or Ukraine and, and you know, the, the collapse of, uh, you know, several banks in the U.S. more recently and so on and so forth, right? But on the SDR, it's a fascinating subject, you know, um, the, 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 the SDR was... The way the system works is that at some point the IMF decides that it is going to create liquidity because, let's say, the world needs it. Uh, the Articles of Agreement, which is like the constitution of the IMF, actually gives the organization the authority to create liquidity. And until 2009, it did so on, on, on two occasions, very sparingly, you know, in amounts that essentially were minimum. But in 2009, in the middle of the global financial crisis, the G20 in a meeting that they had in London decided, yes, let's do a big SDR issue. And so they issued $250 billion, which is, you know, a significant amount. The way that the system works is that each country gets a share of the $250 billion that matches their voting power within the IMF. Okay? It's not called voting power, it's called a quota, but it's, that's the idea, right? That the bigger countries have more power within the governance structure of the organization, and therefore the bigger countries get a bigger chunk of the SDR issue. Right? And so that was that. It helped. It was a sign of cooperation at the global level. If you if you were a small country in in, in Africa or in South America suffering the impact of the global financial crisis, 
which was essentially you know generated within the you know more sophisticated markets of the United States and Europe in particular you were glad to get this little boost to your liquidity which you could use you know to 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 mitigate the impact of the crisis right? in 2021 during during covid uh, the IMF did the next big SDR issue. This time we're talking about kind of biggish money. $650 billion were, were issued and distributed to, to member countries, right? Now, this is, you know, this is more serious money. It, it is a, a boost to liquidity. And the reason they did it, um, and there's a little footnote here, it wasn't done in 2020 because the Trump administration was opposed to it, right? So it was only because there was a change of government in the US. And because the U.S. is a large, the largest shareholder of the IMF, in 2021, under the Biden administration, uh, Secretary Yellen said, if we don't do it now, when do we do it, right? By now, meaning in the middle of the COVID, when countries are basically reeling under, and, under the, 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 the shock of COVID, you know, the collapse of economic activity, the lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera, she very ably said yes you know the world all the countries that have been asking for an sdr issue are right let's do it and they did it 650 billion dollars in august of 2021 now the reason the reason now this is important right but what has happened since then is very interesting little story right that because each country gets its share in in, in proportion to its voting power the United States, out of those $650 billion, got $113 billion, right? Just free cash into the, into the accounts of the Federal Reserve, right? And if you are a small country in Africa, obviously, you know, you have a very small voting share within the IMF governance structure, so you get a smaller amount, right? Every bit helps. But for the first time in 2021, some countries, let's say Sweden or Germany or even Spain, some countries said, you know what? We're glad to get this money, but there are countries that are in greater need of it. So why don't we devise a system whereby we rechannel some of SDR our SDR allocation to poorer countries where the, the needs are greater? Right? And this was a significant development. It is the first time that it ever happened in the history of the IMF, where countries were willing to contemplate the possibility of, you know, uh, on, under the principle of solidarity to actually give some of the of the money that they were getting from the IMF to give it and make it available to other countries. For what? Well, for COVID, for co-poverty, for financing the transition to a renewable energy economy, for education, for whatever the, the country's needs might be, right? This is an interesting story and it's a story that has not come to an end. It is still ongoing. Uh, but it it is it, it, you know sometimes you open the door and you put your foot in the door and then and then you know you press you press and it may take many years and eventually the IMF will come up with a you know workable mechanism and for me the, the, this matters a great deal I'll tell you why because because of the global financial crisis and because of COVID countries are stretched for resources. Um, you know, Spain is a good example. Spain you, you used to have what we economists call a lot, a lot of fiscal space. It had very low levels of public debt, you know, 15 years ago. Today, because of COVID, because of, of, of uh, the global financial crisis, Spanish debt levels are sky high. And therefore, the ability of the country to respond to the next crisis or the ability of the country to come to the support of Africa or other countries in Latin America is much reduced, right? Whereas the IMF doesn't have those constraints. The IMF has a balance sheet that is very light. And therefore, in a crisis, a year, two years, five years from now, you know, it is an instrument which can be used in the middle of a crisis at a time when you may not have that ability because the big countries you know are completely stretched right so so this matters you know it's a little technical it is perhaps a a dimension of global governance that you might say well you know this is a bit non traditional but it is actually very very important because it has to do with better management of the global financial system and this is of vital importance for for governance okay i'll stop arthur back to you Thank you, Augusta.
Thank you. If we come to chapter 16 uh, on the global environmental crisis, I think a lot has happened since that chapter was drafted. I won't go into too much detail. The chapter goes through a bit of the history of environmental governance and so on. But for instance, it refers to a global pact on the environment, which got quite far, a lot of government support in the General Assembly, and suddenly vanished. There was clearly there was opposition in the Assembly, and the idea was dropped entirely. So it got it had a lot of you know, momentum behind it, and then suddenly, because of opposition of certain powerful countries, it simply vanished. Nobody wants to deal with the environment in that comprehensive sense. Um, we propose an, an global environment organization, and there's been some progress since there. Uh, we wrote a paper with a colleague of mine for the Climate Governance Commission on the need for a global environment agency. And uh, so we, there, this is much more specific development on how this might be taken forward, what its functions should be and so on to sort of orchestrate the complex parts of the UN system, not doing everything, but bringing some coherence to the system. And again, with the capacity to be able to adopt binding legislation for you know, the protecting planetary boundaries that we've over, over, already overshooting to a large extent. I will put into the chat a link to that report for anybody who's, who's interested in that. Uh, then of course, with respect to climate change, we've had the latest IPCC report, which is more grim than ever. Uh, things are clearly still getting worse in spite of all of our efforts to, to turn the corner. Uh, we're not succeeding in turning the corner. We're actually going backwards in, in some ways. You know, the pandemic hasn't helped. And so the, you know, both with this and with more like the same goals, you know, everything, things are going in the wrong direction. So we're, we haven't turned the corner yet and we're cl closer to, to tipping points, if not already passing some, which may mean that it'd be impossible to go back again. Uh, sea level rise in particular, because it lags in, in, in the ocean. And you, at the moment, they're just reporting that the ocean is hotter as ever been in history. There are you know, extreme highly high temperatures and we're expecting an El Nino, which might increase them even more. So that the, the science is telling us that uh, you know, it's, things are getting worse much faster than even the scientists have been predicting. So this is really, we're reaching a, a crisis point there and we don't have the capacity yet to respond. With respect to, to biodiversity, there's been a wonderful step forward with the adoption a couple of months ago of a new global convention on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction in the oceans. And so the first time an attempt to try to actually you know, protect ocean resources that are beyond any country's management, part of the global commons, and so it's so been a step forward there in actually agreeing to you know, a major step forward from that point of view. With respect to things like there's over a, you know, a plastics invention now being negotiated and plans for another you know, global scientific advisory process, science policy process on uh, pollution and, and uh, uh, waste, plastic and so on. You know, these things where we haven't had a good mechanism yet to really assess all of the dangers that are coming from all of the chemicals we're reducing and so on. So these are steps being taken forward. And of course, now we've just had the report of the high level advisory board on effective multi multilateralism that the secretary general set up to prepare proposals for the, um, the summit of the future coming up next year. And it has, you know, it again has a quite significant section on you know, what we need to do to fix environmental governance as one of the challenges going forward. And in fact, when it comes to proposals for government of agency, it cites the report I just put into the, you know, into the chat as the, the major source for the proposals. So, you know, there's even being picked up and looked at quite seriously now within the UN system uh, as the directions we need to take to address some of these global environmental crises. <clears throat> I might come in briefly, just, I noticed that Virginia Wayne put into the, into the chat about the, when I talked about silos earlier, referring to Donello Meadows and the limits to growth. Uh, we've of course been thinking about this. I mean, I knew Donello Meadows. I did a book with her, her book when it first came out in 1972. We then worked together on developing indicators of general development for the United Nations. So we've always had you know, you know, a, a, that, that kind of a systems approach in the thing, and we've built that into many things that we put into the book. So. You clearly, it's still totally relevant today. It's of course been updated several times, and uh, we still, you know, are, we're, 
the science is saying we're right on schedule in terms you said we could expect civilization to collapse by 2020 2030 and uh, all the data seems to be existing we're very close to that point at the moment a, a recent report said we may be facing a collapse of the, the food supply within a very few years between climate change and soil degradation and water shortages and so on we may see the reduction in the capacity of the planet to produce food to the point we no longer have enough food to feed all of humanity so you know, we're getting closer and closer to a number of very challenging issues that only effective global governance would allow us to address. Then chapter 17 is on population and migration. And uh, it's a short chapter, but of course it basically points out that we have to take population as a symptom rather than the cause of many of the problems. I mean, the reason populations have been growing so rapidly is because of extreme poverty. Poor people maybe not have no access to birth control. You know, they need people to work, you know, children to work in the fields or girls to sell off early to get a dowry or whatever it is that you know, they're trying to do to survive. And therefore, uh, you know, if we, until we address the problem of extreme poverty that Augusto has referred to, we can expect to continue to have rapid population growth among poor populations. Whereas among the wealthy countries, we have declining populations, we have aging populations, we have a shortage of young people to pay the, you know, pay for the retirement of old people and so on who are going in the wrong direction. And some recent projections suggest that in fact, we may see population growth planetary peaking sooner and dropping faster than had been expected even, even a few years ago. And of course also, you know, it all depends, you know, the carrying capacity of the planet depends very much on the, you know, the, the standard of living. And this is the wealthy causing most of our environmental problems. Uh, you know, it's reducing their standard of living that would leave a little more space for other parts of the world to increase there to the point where we can eliminate poverty and meet everybody's needs. And then of course, the major issue that's coming up now with respect to that chapter is migration. And we already addressed the, 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 the challenge of, we already see how this has become a sensitive issue in so many countries of the world, you know, highly political, rejection of migrants and so on, re rejecting refugees. And yet when we look at what climate change is bringing to us, the, the projections are that we will see by the end of this century between 900 million and 2 billion displaced people. Now, as sea level rise, major coastal cities are going underwater. Uh, they're, they're, you know, you know, the numbers that involved, and you know, this, is, this is a scientific reality. This is not just something that that is, is, is in a political imagination. And how we manage that, how we find, how, how we deal with those issues without a complete compliance society is going to be a major challenge to governance you know, in the years ahead. I won't go any further at this point. I wanna leave some time for the discussion. I hope we've stimulated you to have some good questions for us to take these issues further. And thank you for joining us in this brief review of those interesting chapters. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much, Arthur. So at this time, I'll invite anyone who has a question to raise their cyber hand. The software automatically puts them in order. So I'll call on those people. And then the folks who um, don't have that function or don't know how to use it, then I'll just take all the flesh and blood hands after that. So let's start with David. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, oh, and let me just ask everybody to be as brief as possible so we can get everybody in. Thank okay. You. Sorry about that, David. No, no worries. So on page 307, you say, ultimately, the rights and opportunities of a human being should not be conditioned by something as arbitrary as one, where one is born. You sort of follow that up on page 325, saying basic forms of social support should be something that one is entitled to as a member of the human race. And then on page 331, you say legislators should see themselves as trustees of all of humanity. So my question is, um, could you provide some suggestions of how we can make world citizenship a recognized legal status throughout the world. Okay, whoever would like to take that? Well, I'll, I'll begin and make sure Augusto can add, but I think clearly, you know, the, the world has become one physically. Technology has united all into basically one human family and biologically, we're only one human family, one species. And so just from a scientific perspective, you know, it is logical that we consider ourselves as you know, citizens of one planet. Now, of course, that runs up against the, you know, the paradigm of national sovereignty, which is, you know, you created the borders, you know, it goes back a few hundred years, but it's clearly 
you know, passe in the sense that, as we've already seen, the economy is no longer limited within borders. Uh, most parts of society have globalized. It's only those clinging to this idea of national sovereignty that you know, are trying to defend borders or in some cases invade borders with their own concept of what should be the, the appropriate sovereign nation. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is you know, the bankruptcy of the concept of national sovereignty. Now, what is needed and in a world of great diversity is national autonomy. And that's you know, that each country should be able within their own particular cultural framework and their environmental characteristics and so on, be able to say, how do they apply those aspects of global responsibility that you know, are relevant to their particular country? So in fact, we have to get, we, we're still stuck politically in this concept of national sovereignty uh, when we ought to be acknowledging that we need to think that differently as national autonomy. Now, of course, today, national sovereignty has largely become the defense of the autocrats and the corrupt against anybody interfering with the interfering in affairs. You know, it's the failures of government that are being defended by that concept. So I think they're all, all the logic is there. That we should take that step to you know, some kind of global citizenship, acknowledging the wonderful differences among peoples and appreciating that but giving it a better legal framework. And that's clearly one of the steps that has to be taken in the years ahead. And hopefully if you get a stronger UN charter, maybe that will open the door to stepping away from national sovereignty and to actually achieve what you're talking about, world citizenship. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Arthur. Augusto, did you wanna add? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, just a couple of, uh, you know, you, you motivated, uh, the question was motivated by something that we wrote in the, in the book about, um, that our economic system should not be should not be designed in such a way that the place that where you are born may have dramatically different implications for the for the path of your life. You know, if you're born in Norway, uh, you're going to have a life of leisure, opportunity, education. Uh, you know, a safety net to protect you. If you're born in a sub-Saharan African country. You may be one of 800 million un, 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 malnourished people. You may not reach the age of one. Your average life expectancy is going to be um, much shorter. And we think that you know there is no ethical system uh, that that can justify this kind of injustice, right? You know, the most you can say, well, that is the world that we live in, right? But that's not, you know, that's not an argument. It's just a description of you know uh, the profound injustice that underpins our. Our economic system, and so some of the thinking that we and, and, uh, that we did, and, and some of the solutions that we proposed in the chapter on inequality, are actually aimed at you know moving away from that that system. Uh, and there is a very active discussion underway, you know, for instance, on uh, at least in some countries uh, the, the notion of of uh, you know having a safety net that essentially protects people from from you know, falling below the extreme poverty line, and which then raises the question of resource allocation and misspent monies and so on and so forth. It's a big subject, but it's an important, an important one. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Gail, you're up next. Um, on page 311 in, uh, this is in chapter 14, um, inequality between individuals. It says, while hunter-gatherer societies were generally quite egalitarian, more complex settled societies tended to, well, that, you know, the change of ec global economic system led to the rise of inequality. So my question is, if social structure um, generates the, um, uh, if economic structure generates the social structure, then how can we structure um, an economic structure, how can an economic structure be designed and implemented to generate increased egalitarianism? And in conjunction with that, with a later chapter, you mentioned the um, rise of the multinational corporations. Actually, um, trans-global corporations could perhaps be viewed as more powerful than governments, national governments. And yet we're not focused on those, we're focused on governments. So I'm wondering whether the, you know, our change of focus should be to reining in and regulating um, these multinational corporations as because they're the basis of this 
um, economic system, which has generated this um, inappropriate, um, from a humanitarian point of view, social system. Um, let me let let I will leave Arthur to deal with the with the sort of multinational corporation aspect of your question, which I think is very relevant. Uh, but in terms of you know how can we create a more fair economic system that doesn't that doesn't coexist with these with these inequalities or you know with extreme levels of of of, of poverty and my, my answer to that question is that we have the tools we have the instrument it is not that we're lacking in knowledge it is not that we don't have examples of countries which have largely addressed the problem of inequality okay there are such examples and and you know something that i learned from spending the best, the, 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 the biggest, the biggest share of my professional career at the IMF and the World Bank is that those instruments can be deployed and have been deployed in a number of country contexts. Right? So, you know, we need to share in that knowledge. We need to, we need to learn from other countries' experiences. Uh, I think what is lacking very often is best is, is first of all political will. And you know, governments that have the credibility to in to to design public policies that actually solve these problems. Um, very often we have, and I'm sure Arthur will mention this. Very often we have situations where uh, governments are reluctant to take on vested interests, where they give uh, corporations freedom to operate in ways that do not contribute to equity, but actually worsen equity. Right. So um, we don't need to rediscover the wheel. The knowledge is there, the instruments are there. We know how to address these problems. It just needs to be done. And the countries that have done it are more stable societies. They're happier societies. They, they, have, they have, you know, on, on the issue of happiness, you know that there is a, there is a world happiness index, right? And, and you know which, which countries are the, the happiest in the world? Believe it or not, are those countries that are the most equitable, where levels of inequality have been reduced in a, in, in a fairly important way. Great. Thank you. Arthur? Well, on the multinational corporations, clearly, you know, they have become more powerful than most governments. And they have so much wealth and influence that they can lobby, they can corrupt, they can do anything they want to bend governments to their will to defend their interests, to pass international agreements that say that any government that tries to regulate the environment and reduce the profits of a company must reimburse the company for any profits that are lost, you know, as a result of trying to protect the common good. You know, basically, we've, we've created a set of institutions apart from the government institutions, which normally that only have one purpose legally, and that is to make profits for the shareholders. Basically, we've institutionalized greed, and therefore, it's it's a it's not, we, we all we, we criticize individuals as being greedy and so on and so forth. But we actually built that same value of more and more wealth, whether it be into the growth paradigm, GDP growing forever, or whether it be the corporate paradigm, higher share value, higher profits for the shareholders, higher uh, remuneration for the you know the the corporate leaders and so on. Uh, it's a whole set of values underlying them. So we have to say, well, we need to change the institutional framework there as we're talking about changing that for governments, which basically would mean that we need to, in some way, be able to require those such corporations to include in their legal charter some social responsibility, some good they will do for society. And that, you know, profiting should, profit should be simply one sign of efficiency among others in doing that job well. But that there should be a, some kind of a social purpose. Some government countries are beginning to do it. There, some co companies are already thinking of their the B corporations and so on. There's some steps in this direction. There are a number of things that are beginning to question that uh, that focus totally uh, on profits. So there there is something. But the other dimension, of course, that is that how we measure well-being or progress. As long as our system of measurement are entirely in money, entirely in dollars or whatever, entirely you know, in financial terms, that again feeds you know the greed for people who want wealth. We and that, that's why they again that we see the Secretary General and others say we have to find something beyond GDP. You know, we can't have you know the economy growing forever on a limited planet. And therefore 
you know, we've done some of the recent work, probably since the book's been written, like how do we come up with other measures of progress of well-being that would escape from that trap of thinking only in terms of money, which of course denies all the things that aren't traded in the market. It denies women's ra raising children as not part of the economy and so on. And therefore we think, well, we need to come up with other alternative indicators of well-being, be environmental indicators. So you could take carbon as a currency. And so carbon average is carbon debt, carbon in the ground is carbon capital. And we need to value carbon sequestration as much as we want to penalize carbon releases. We ought to look at biodiversity, nature as the capital to be maintained and protected. Uh, pollution, of course, is destroying the healthy environment that we have. So we have a kind of pollution debt to be paid off. We have kept eliminating poverty should be can be measured not only in terms of how many how much money a person earns per day, but do they have adequate shelter? Do they have clean water? Do they have sanitation? Some sense of security. You know, some indigenous peoples are, are considered extremely poor, but they take care of themselves. They have adequate housing. They live quite comfortably, and so on. But it's not counted as part of the economy, and therefore we need we need food accounts. We need health accounts. We need knowledge and and science and art and culture accounts, which again, except where it's privatized intellectual property, is totally ignored in the present economic system. And then ultimately, we need to have you know, some kind of, you might say, not only work accounts, but opportunities of service, that every human being doing something useful for society. And that can be measured in other ways than simply are they earning a salary, because many very useful things aren't salaried at the moment. And ultimately, we probably have some accounts for values and ethics and spirituality. How well are our societies actually incorporating the higher values that ought to be what should be emerging in a, in a civilization and not just the material side of things as we do at present. So that's a brief summary of some thinking that we need to take things forward to find an alternative to the domination of the materialist system that we have at present. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Before I bring Joseph in, I just want to remind people that we've got a little less than a half an hour left. We've currently got six people in the queue. So if everyone could be as brief as possible and asking their questions so we can get the maximal number of people in. Thank you. And with that, Joseph, you're on. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, I must say that uh, in reading this book and these last few chapters too, I feel the same thing. The Analysis is abundant about our problems. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm constantly reminded of, an, of a rather a dismal book. Uh, uh, Brian Watson's uh, Into the Abyss. Uh, Watson points out that um, even some 10 uh, issue areas, including global warming, and uh, say the lack of uh, a world uh, reserve currency like based on the SDR, well, these problems are well known. The solutions to these problems are, are, are abundantly shown. And yet uh, uh, we seem not to be able to act. I must say that um, as a historian, no great, uh, no great uh, international uh, turning point has been achieved without a very powerful, large public opinion, uh, kind of on the order of the anti-war movement in, uh, during the Vietnam War, or even before that, uh, the determination of the immense majority of all humanity that after the Second World War, that there should never again be such a general war. Those kind, that kind of pr popular opinion was what prompted states, starting with the United States of America, to uh, make uh, the innovations that have produced the present system, including the United Nations and the and the uh, IMF and World Bank. I wonder how you think your work is going to help to arouse a, a great public opinion behind your solutions. Uh, your this uh, is the uh, Citizens for Global Solutions, and uh, we have people here from the World Federalist Movement. These are minuscule. And uh, it looks to me like Brian Watson is on the right track. We're headed for the abyss. Uh, it may be that uh, in the next great catastrophe, humanity will wake up to the point where the public opinion will materialize. But I, I wonder if what you think about uh, 
helping along some of these little groups that are trying to build such a public opinion. Okay, thank you. Which of our authors will address the abyss? I can if you'd like to start, you know. <laughs> I'm probably the oldest of, of us, so I'm closer to it than, than many others. Uh, well, I think clearly public opinion would be the logical way forward. But unfortunately, in, living in a world in which the media are more and more dominated by the economic interests that don't want to see that change, it's getting less and less possible to imagine people voluntarily getting that massive public opinion for the changes needed. So you know, one could say, well, we could wait for the return of Christ, we could wait for a re religious transformation. Uh, you know, uh, that may be a longer solution, but I think more and more is looking as though we may have to go through some kind of a catastrophe before finally, you know, the political will and the, you know, the power is there to, to make that transition. And I think, you know, we, at the end of the book, if you've gotten to the end, we sort of explore some of the possibilities uh, you know, I've, so if, well, I think we at least have to be acknowledge the, the reality, the longer we wait to make an intelligent trans, transformation, the closer we are to one or more abysses or maybe a whole series altogether. And then, then the question is this, do, what, how do we have a foundation now to emerge as quickly as possible from the abyss and crawl out the other side, preserving as much as we can of what we've, what we've learned so far? And we wrote that book partly thinking, well, Maybe it will convince people to solve the United Nations problem. If not, it's sitting on the table, survivors can turn to it and say, this is what we should have done. Let's do it now. Augusto, do you want to add something? Um, just very briefly, because I, I see the clock and I see the number of people waiting. You know, uh, some good news to share. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, uh, Professor Barata will, will be especially interested in, given you know, the magnificent work that he has done in this space in, in recent decades. Um, the, the Global Governance Forum made a proposal to the High Level Advisory Board that for the Summit of the Future in 2024, we should include consideration of um, you know, reviewing or the, the UN Charter under Article 109. When we made this proposal last September, to be absolutely frank with you, we did not think that this proposal would fly because the you know rethinking the UN Charter is practically a taboo matter within the corridors of power at the UN. And yet the High Level Advisory Board in their report issued a couple of weeks ago endorsed this proposal and now it is formally in the report. And we expect that in 2024, there will be a discussion at that summit of possibly reforming the UN Charter. Okay, I think this is this you know this would not have happened uh, 20 years ago. I think this is a reflection of the power of civil society organizations to begin gradually to shape the debate around global governance issues. Okay, thank you, Augusto. Uh, Lynn, you're up next. You this, need to, yeah. this Go is ahead. to Augusto. Um, I wondered if you know the other side of the story with regards to women's rights on the jobs that you discussed uh, in Russia. And I wonder um, if Putin and Russia would have that same viewpoint that they're just cutting women out of certain jobs. And also women would probably just establish other jobs and make up for it in a big way, possibly anyway. But I'm just skeptical that um, that I'm pretty communist, I guess, honestly. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to hear um, your argument from Putin's side. Augusta, you're on mute, yeah. Yeah, I was just sharing with you, Lynn, a, a statistic that we compiled at the, at the, at the World Bank. I see that Rebecca Shoot has sent uh, in an earlier message a few minutes ago a link to the to the, the to the report that I, to the database that I was referring to the Women Business and the Law database. Well, that report tracks discriminations against women uh, in the law, you know, in a large number of countries. But but beyond the database, we also compiled you know a lot of very useful information, and it's basically from that additional information that we were able to identify in Russia, 456 occupations which are forbidden to women. Um, 
It's interestingly, I raised this issue at the highest political levels in Moscow a few years ago. Um, I met with essentially their economic czar, um, the sort of the super minister in charge of the entire economic area. We met in the White House and I raised this issue and, and he was, he was uh, sort of bewildered. You know, initially he thought that my data was wrong, but when I gave him examples, and I think he realized that I had a list of the 456 uh, uh, restrictions, you know, he decided not to pursue the matter. But, but he told me initially, well, this is a legacy of the Soviet Union, and you know, which begs the question, well, you know, 30 years later, why, why are these the restrictions still in the books? Then he said, uh, well, many of these restrictions were introduced to protect women. But in fact, when you actually look at the, at the, at the uh, uh, descriptions, there is no way to justify them on the basis of protecting women. How does it protect a woman not to be able to drive the metro in the underground, you know, when these are extremely, extremely uh, sort of safe uh, 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 machines, you know, uh, and there is very little in the way of accidents, right? So. I'm afraid that uh, I, I, it may create a bit of uh, cognitive dissonance uh, in, in your case that this is a reality of women in Russia. Unfortunately, the data provides evidence in a very compelling fashion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Augusto. Did he argue um, back, Augusto? I'm, I'm sorry, Lynn, what was that? Did he argue back? Uh, Lynn, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're, you're what you're asking. What I, I answered you. I answered your question, right? What was his response when you when you challenged him? Uh, no, I was just uh, I was just saying that I was sharing a data point about the condition of, of women in Russia. That's all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we are going to need to move on. Um, Rebecca, I saw your note. So, John, you're up next. Sorry, I didn't see the note, I didn't realize. Um, so I have an observation <laughs> for Arthur. Um, Arthur, you said by being the eldest one here, you're closest to the abyss. That, that's not correct. I think by being the eldest one here, you're best placed to avoid it, so, so well done. <laughs> um, and a question for Augusto. Um, do you see a route from the unequal world we live in to the more equal world we seek, a way of shifting how we share the global pie that can be sold to Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States? Um, in inequality, as I said uh, before, it is an issue of distribution and it's an issue of good public policies, right? Um, there is there is no feature in the in the economic system that we have which necessarily has to end up having a very unequal society, right? Um, our, Arthur and I have had this this conversation before, right? You know, the, the, the question is, is the capitalist system one which inevitably leads to inequality? And I, and, and I would say, well, not necessarily. Uh, you know, Sweden and, and, and Denmark and Finland and Norway, all these countries that have the lowest levels of inequality in the world, the lowest Gini coefficients, have many of the features of a capitalist system. You know, they have private property, you know, they have this, the state largely out of the production of goods and services. The, the, the state is largely the body that administers the law, that regulates the system and, and so on and so forth. And the wealth is created largely within the private sector, right? But there is a government, there is a role for the government through the tax system and through other public policies, which has created a safety net and so on, which led these countries to be capitalists on the one hand, at the same time have very low levels of inequality. So I emphasize the point, this is something that is amenable to good public policies. Uh, Argentina and, and uh, 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 South Africa and Z Zimbabwe don't have them, and the, the other, uh, other countries do. And, and there is nothing that will prevent one country, such as Argentina, to having you know, a more coherent, more well thought out uh, set of public policies, which basically allow the country to grow, to prosper, to have, you know, more reasonable levels of inequality and, and, and so on.
Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, uh, Arthur. Did you want to add anything? Well, I think only that. I think the point that goes make is very good. You know, the system will work if you have strong government as well. The the challenges come with the neoliberal policies. You know, the less government, the better. You know, eliminate all restrictions. You know, leave free reign to capitalism. You know, without looking at the, the, at the social good. And it's in those areas that you have the increasing inequality and you have, you might say, you know, the failures of, of, you might say, the extreme form of capitalism that is not balanced by a certain sense of the common good everybody together. Thank you. Great, thank you. So let's turn to Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much. and and. Um, I apologize for my very bad habit of polluting the chat, um, which we were told at the outset was not going to be on monitor, but I would draw attention to the Women, Business, and the Law report. And uh, Lynn, I think if you were to dive a little bit deeper into that for the Russian Federation, you um, might get a little bit more data, um, and I would be happy to speak as somebody who's worked on that issue in that country, as well as our um, wonderful speakers. I guess I have one observation from which flow two questions, one more um, philosophical and one more practical. Um, so the observation is basically, um, I was introduced as an international lawyer and every international law class that I entered pretty much started with the existential question, is there such a thing as international law? And what I boil that down to is, is there accountability? What happens when you violate international law, what happens as a state, as an individual, as a corporate entity, et cetera. Um, in the book, you have contemplated in earlier chapters, the limitations of the UPR and uh, for human rights issues. For all of the other treaties, of course, there's um, a plethora, and you mentioned this as well, um, of, um, of treaty bodies and organizations and entities that are meant to hold folks accountable. When I say folks, I guess I mean states, but I also mean individuals and corporate entities. Um, the reason why states like Nauru or Palau do not ratify many treaties is because they, as you mentioned, I was really happy to see this, um, many treaties is not lack of political will, it's lack of capacity to keep up with the reporting requirements. So how do we make it easier for states that have the willingness, entities that have the willingness to comply to do so. Um, and I think somewhat related to this, um, this chapter, one of these chapters discusses uh, the SDGs. Coming up in September, we have the midpoint of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, are there markers of progress uh, that you would like to see? And for those of us in civil society, those of us um, in advocacy positions, what can we do um, to take this milestone, however um, um, silly some of these markers may be, and make something meaningful of it? So thank you. Well, maybe with respect to the accountability and capacity, having been the advisor to all the Pacific Island countries for more than a decade, I'm very sensitive to the challenges of Nauru and the Palau and so on. And in fact, I built a regional environmental organization to help them collectively, where in, in, separately they could not manage this. At the same time, we do see countries like Vanuatu achieving you know, you know, an, an issue all the way to the National Court of Justice. So you know, they are they are they're acquiring a voice, they are, you know, finding a place at the table within their limited capacity. And it's very encouraging to see that. But clearly we need, and this is where, when, when, we, when we were looking at, for instance, how we would look at the future membership of the General Assembly, you know, we would see something that, you know, one part of that has to be each country having a voice as opposed to saying, well, Nauru and China should have equal voices, uh, but they all should have a voice. And we have to make certain that none of, nobody's excluded because they're small and with limited capacity. So I think there are ways of dealing with those extreme differences from, from that point of view. Unfortunately, with respect to the same development goals, the last one, the Secretary General, which he just gave to the General Assembly you know, when they launched the, you know, the latest SDG report, is very depressing on how we're going backwards on most of them, that the indicators of the progress are, are, are really quite grim at the moment. And I'm afraid that what we're going to be seeing when they come to the review in September is 
that we're, you, we're not doing it all well, and uh, we've really got to say, how do we turn the corner in making progress there? That's what I could contribute. Augusto, do you want to say something? Augusto, are, are you about to speak? No, no, oh, no. I, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, then I'll, I'll call on myself. And I, I was actually going to ask a question very parallel to Joseph's question. So I, I won't ask the question. I'll just make a quick comment. And if you have anything to say to the comment, that, that's fine. Um, but, you know, I, I do, I mean, it is clear in your book and in the conversations we've been having that we do have solutions to most, if not all of these issues, or at least ways to partially remedy these problems. But we lack what's often called political will. So it seems to me that there are two ways to generate political will. You know, one is a crisis, you know, a world war, a global pandemic, although that didn't even do it this time. Um, but, you, you know, some, some type of horrendous thing happening on a global level. Or the other way, if we wanna kind of head it off at the pass and not have that happen, is something that's more maybe a psychological intervention or a marketing intervention or an educational intervention. I mean, some, because continuing to restate the same solutions seems to be bouncing off deaf ears. So it's like, what do we do rather than say it again or say it louder or what have you, or do we just wait for the next crisis to create a, a window? So, so that's kind of my, well, I guess it is a question there and a comment at the same time. And let me just add one more part, which is the countries, I, I think either all of the countries or at least most of the countries that have been successful at reducing the extreme wealth inequality have been largely culturally homogenous. That you, the people in Norway or the people in a lot of other countries, the Scandinavian countries, whatever, don't, um, point to a lot of others as others, you know, that, that they, they see themselves in the others, which I think, again, psychologically generates more solidarity as opposed to a country that has a very diverse population and people who've been there for centuries and others who are just arriving and folks see that them as a threat. And them, I mean, that, that's another level of intervention that's needed to have us all view us view us all as human beings. So um, so so that so that that's I guess my my thinking about that. Thinking we need some type of psychological intervention to overcome this because just restating the solutions doesn't seem to be doing it um, until we wait for another crisis to precipitate that openness. So, thank you. Well, maybe if I could, with respect to that question of of cultural homogenous. Uh, I think this is where we need a basic questioning of that value. What is the value of being all the same? And what perhaps is the greater value of appreciating our diversity and, and you know, enjoying that diversity and taking forward? I happen to live in a country which is sort of surprisingly diverse, Switzerland, with four national languages, a federation of many independent states, uh, and with the second highest percentage of immigrants in Europe. Uh, and a few years ago, the, the, you know, in the, the town where I'm living, the, for the Swiss national holiday, the guest of honor was Portugal, with Portuguese dancing, Portuguese in the Portuguese. And the mayor said, one quarter of our population is Portuguese, we're celebrating our diversity. The next year, it was Kosovo. The Kosovars have, have come here, we're learning about their culture and so on. So it is possible for a country to, to be open to diversity, to you know, see the, the strengths in that diversity and you know, to, to, to build on that. So it's, it doesn't, we don't have to think of you know, uniformity as only xenophobia. Uh, it's politically perhaps it's often turned that way, but it is certainly possible with a, with a broader set of values to go forward. And so I, th I think with respect to you know, political will, of course, so we've already pointed out whole, the whole series of cases where behind political will is the lobbying, is the weight of money and power and corruption and so on. You know, the, case, the failures in political will are generally due to the fact that there are these major actors in society, but they're, you know, they're 
their political or economic interests come first and they couldn't care about the rest. And so until we address the problems at that level, the problem of political will will continue to be you know, the result of a series of failures of governance, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Augusto, anything you wanted to add? No, I think I'll pass because it's 7.27. I'm sorry, it's 12.27 uh, um, for you. Right. Well, we, we have reached the ending time, but Arthur, you've had your hand up throughout. If you can get your question in in less than a minute, we'll take you. You are still on mute. You are still on mute. Okay, well, seeing the technical issue, I'm gonna switch over then um, to uh, opening for announcements, if anyone has an announcement. Uh, Bob, Simon has his physical hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Th I thank you, I didn't see that. Simon? Simon, you are still on mute. Thank, thank you very much for a very rich discussion. We are all interrelated as well as diverse. So we have to consider both. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Simon. Okay, again, open for any announcements at this time. Yes, oh yes, Gail, we need to talk about the next date and all the rest. The next uh, session will be on Saturday, June 10 which is the second Saturday of the month, which fits our pattern. And at the same time, namely noon to 1.30 Eastern time, and we will finish this book. Uh, we'll tackle part four, cross-cutting issues, part five, foundations for a new global governance system, and part six, conclusions. So all together, that's 100 pages. Um, and then we'll need to decide whether we want a general discussion session after the end of the book, um, because each of these sessions, you know, we have limited time for discussion and it's not in an integrative kind of way. So we have had, you know, that, but we don't have to have it. Um, and I should ask, um, Drea, I think, knows the most about the next book after this one that we'll be picking. Drea? Um, so Peacemakers um, by the author Manu Bhagavan. Um, I will put a link to Eventbrite that has all the details. Um, oh, there's Bob showing this wonderful book. Um, and he is available um, starting September. So we'll take August off and then we'll start the next series in September. But I will put a link in Eventbrite that has all the details. Great, thank you. And David, it looks like you have an announcement. Yeah, just a quick announcement. In the chat, I put uh, two pledges for individuals as well as organizations who might want to support the creation of a World Court of Human Rights. So if you look in the chat, you can find those. I can also email those directly to people. Thanks. Great, thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and especially our authors for another stimulating conversation. It uh, feels like a, a, a real download of richness uh, each month that we get together. So I'm going to invite our production team to stay on for our, our debriefing. And if Augusto or Arthur, you want to let us know anything about you know, how this has worked or whatever, you could stay on with us for a few moments as well. So with that, we'll say goodbye to all the participants. See you next month.